Hello, my lovely people, and welcome to Owen's Mind, a light-hearted trip through the contents of my head and the world in general. It is Sunday, the 12th of January. My name is Owen, and here is what is on my mind today. So I apologize for this monumental shine on my head. Um, I've adjusted the green screen as much as I can. The lighting here is not great. Um, but the only way I can get the green screen stable is if I have this sort of glowing halo of brightness. So... I might have to wear like a hat in future or something. I'll put some powder on, put some, some pancake on just to just kind of dull it all down so you don't get blinded by my shiny bald head. I do apologise. Anyway, as usual, I've picked out five stories making the headlines what to give my thoughts on today. Links will be in the description below so you can read each article in full and show those original publications some love. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. Story number one. Story number one today comes from BBC News. The Queen and Prince Harry to hold talks over the Sussex's future. So yeah, this has been all over the news recently about uh, Harry and Meghan saying they want you to step back from their position as um, the royals, and apparently the royal family has not taken it well. Um, so yeah, the article reads as follows, The Queen has summoned senior royals to Sandringham on Monday for face-to-face -face talks to discuss the future roles of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Uh, palace officials told the BBC that Prince Harry, the Duke of Cambridge and the Prince of Wales will all attend, while Meghan is expected to join the discussion over a phone from Canada. Uh, they say they plan to step back as senior members of the Royals, but there is no suggestion that a conclusion will be reached during this meeting. Um, yeah, but BC Royal correspondent Johnny Diamond said he's hoped that the talks will produce a next step on a way of defining a couple's new relationship with the Royal family in line with the Queen's wish to find a solution within days. Yeah, there will be a formidable obstacles to overcome in the talks. Uh, BBC Royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell said the trickiest area will be to agree the financial position of the Sussexes, Sussexes who said in their statement on Wednesday they intend to step back as senior royals and work to become financially independent. The couple also said they plan to split their time between the UK and North America while continuing to honour our duty to the Queen, the Commonwealth and our patronage. There's likely to be tax implications to any decision to base themselves outside of the UK for any length of time, and Buckingham Palace will want tight protocols to prevent them cashing in on their royal status. Um, Monday's gathering at the Queen's Estate in Norfolk, being described as the Sandringham Summit, will be the first time the monarch has come face to face with Harry since the Sussex's announcement, which was posted on their official Instagram account. Uh, the royal family was said to be hurt at the couple's statement. It is understood the Queen will not, was not consulted in advance of their decision. Uh, the Queen, Prince Charles, William and Harry are expected to review a range of possibilities for the Sussexes, taking into account plans outlined by the couple. Uh, if a deal is agreed in the coming days, there is a general understanding it will take some time to implement uh, Prince Charles is currently in Oman after travelling overnight to attend the first of three days of official condolences alongside the Prime Minister Boris Johnson following the death of Sultan uh, Kabuz bin Saad al Saad. Um, Monday's Royal Summit may not be the last such gathering needed to sort things out, but enough progress has been made by palace staff and civil servants for the most senior members of the family to meet to discuss some pretty concrete proposals on the way ahead for Prince Harry and Meghan. Um, yeah, so it's not clear at all how much of the way of royal duties the Prince of Meghan will see themselves doing uh, on that will hang issues such as funding and liaison between the palace and Prince Harry and Meghan's new organisation. Unpicking the current relationship is complicated, creating a new one that lasts will be even tougher. Um, the article goes on and there's a lot of information in there. Um, but the general gist of it is that, yeah, the senior royals are not happy with this... Um, statement from um, Harry and Meghan saying, you know, we want to step back, we want to kind of honour our duty to the Queen, but we want to kind of forge our own path. Um, the thing is, for anybody watching this outside of the UK, the, um, you know, people have various opinions on the Royals, but it is bogged down in tradition. It's everything that has got to be done via protocol, and to do this is not is a big no-no as far as Palace is concerned. As far as Harry and Meghan are concerned, you know, this is the age we live in now. They made the announcement via Instagram. You know, there wasn't an official statement, they weren't stood on a balcony and it wasn't a proclamation. It was like, you know, this is the way of the world now. We're two young people, we have a young family and we want to kind of go our own way. So I can kind of see both sides. From the royal side, I can see that um you know, again, tradition rules over everything, and they don't want Harry and Meghan cashing in on their royal status, although they are royals. But once that, when they're in the fold, when they're part of the family and the unit, 
their actions can be very, very closely monitored and they it will be harder for them to do something which might, you know, intentionally or otherwise bring a black mark onto the royal family. But, but they support a certain thing or, you know, they say a certain thing or any kind of public misstep. They can be minimised and managed because everything is so, you know, tightly monitored and, and controlled, if you will. If they're outside of that, then there's less control, essentially. If the royals, if Harry and Meghan's decisions are not being run by senior royals and senior royal officials, but more by, um, you know, personal assistants and PR people, maybe, to grow their brand, then maybe something could happen. But because they're still royals, it could still, you know, cast some shade on the royal family, even though, you know, it kind of happened outside of their remit. So I kind of get, oh, my personal thing is, Harry and Meghan, they're, they're adults. And yes, there is this... Um, expectation that they remain within this royal family, but it must be quite a burden in a way. I mean, it's yeah. You look at it, and it's like these people they they turn up and they shake hands and they wave and you know and and they live a life of luxury on taxpayers' money. There's all this kind of negativity in that, but that must be quite claustrophobic as well. Not being able to make certain decisions because it's like no, that would look bad for this, look bad for that. So I find it a little, the issue I have here is a little bit the Queen is furious and Prince Philip is furious and Prince Charles is furious about, about this couple wanting to do their own thing with their son. A couple of weeks ago, Prince Andrew has been accused and only accused of something. Never heard this reaction from the royal family now, admittedly they probably to keep it internal. But they're disappointed in Harry and Meghan for wanting to, you know, launch their own, um, it says they're preparing to launch the Sussex Royal Charity, they set up after the split from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's foundation last year, you know, so they want to do good things and going their own way to do it and see the royals are furious. Yeah, another royal has been accused of some horrible things and there's been very little in regard to reaction from royals. Now again, they probably kind of didn't want to you know, but people with inside the circle always like, oh, the, the Queen's very disappointed, is very disappointed in that. And there was none of that with Andrew. It's not going like, yeah, the Queen is absolutely mortified by these accusations. And they are just accusations, but it just seems a little bit lopsided that a senior royal can be accused of something or get embroiled in a situation, you know, rightly or wrongly, we don't know at this point. And she has very little to say, and no word came out of the palace about, oh, you know, they're concerned, they're bothered, they're angry, they're frustrated. But then Harry and Meghan just say, you know what, we're going to kind of do our own thing, peace. And um, everyone loses their mind. So I think they should be allowed to make their own decisions. Whether they should carry the royal brand or not, that is that is a discussion that would be tricky for me to kind of come down on one side, say, well, yeah, if you want to go your own way, then you go your own way. Have at it. You know, but you can't you can't step aside and say, right, we're going to do our own thing, but we still want the financial support, we still want to carry the brand because it's going to help us, you know, market ourselves going forward. So that is a tricky area for me. But in regards to them wanting to step back, I think that should be their choice, and I can see why the Queen and the Royals would be disappointed because it's a break of tradition. But you know, you've got to let people do what they want to do. So there we go. Anyway, we'll see how, it, see how it all turns out. Let's move on. Story number two. So this is in the Mail Online today. British doctors accused of cashing in on the fears of young Muslim women by offering secret virginity repair operations to help them prove they are pure for marriage. Right. So uh, British doctors are earning thousands at a time for performing virginity repair operations on young women under pressure from their traditional families that emerged. It's believed there are hundreds of girls being forced to go through an intimate procedure called a hymenoplasty to prove they are pure for their wedding night. More commonly known as a hymen repair, the operation involves constructing a layer of skin at the entrance of the vagina that can tear when a woman first has sexual intercourse. It takes less than an hour as performed at a local anaesthetic. An investigation by the Sunday Times found that there are at least 22 clinics offering the service privately, mostly in London. One such clinic, the Gynae Centre, or the Gynae Centre in central London, recommends having a small operation because the hymen is considered a token of virginity for cultural and religious reasons and can be an important factor in a new marriage. Uh, in many cases, marriages are even annulled if the hymen is torn. Some private clinics charge up to £3,000 to law patients with advertisements that promise the surgery can restore your innocence and are 100% safe. 
uh, campaigners have accused the clinics of capitalising on the fears of patients. The majority are young Muslim women from Middle Eastern and Asian families under pressure to be untouched when they marry. Extramarital sex or zina is forbidden by the Quran. Uh, guidance from the General Medical Council says that before undertaking any procedure, practitioners must obtain a patient's informed consent, which uh, may not be valid if given under the pressure or duress exerted by another person. Uh, Dr. Leila Frodsham from the Loyal Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists said hymen repair perpetuated harmful myths about virginity. I think people will be surprised to know this is going on. There are a lot of people making a lot of money out of very, very vulnerable women, she said. Mohammed Massoud, director of the MAS Gynecology, said requests for the procedure at its Halajri clinic has risen fourfold since 2014. He said his patients typically found him online were almost exclusively Muslim and that girls would be the subject of, to stigma if they didn't believe in losing their virginity. Oh God. Halali Tahari, Tahari, founder of the Middle Eastern Women and Society organization based in Finsbury Park, North London, said she had dealt with several cases of women who grew up here and felt they had a right to have sex, but were then forced into marriage. They don't know what to do, she said. Um, she's also been contacted by mothers asking where they can take their girls for surgery. They're often very scared the father will find out. Um, Anita Prem, founder of the charity Freedom, said women often feared being viewed as second-hand goods, she said. It is a dreadful practice. Virginity repair surgery is legal in the UK. Critics claim demands for the operation is based on the belief that hymen is a seal that breaks during sex. Uh, Mr. Masood denied claims that surgeons were cashing in on young women's fears. I have seen tragic situations where I felt as though I was saving a life. It is a very sad situation. Okay, so a couple of points there. Um, this is not new. This has been around for a long time. And like that last statement that says, I've seen tragic situations where I felt as though I was saving a life. There is this, this whole honour system where it can be women have had horrible things done to them. They have been you know, ostracised, cast aside. I think there's all, even been honour killings and things because, you know, oh, this woman is not pure. A couple of things. First, hymens will break not just from sex. If you ride a horse, if you ride a bike, if you're very physically active, a hymen is not this... There's many ways a hymen can be broken. So a lot of these girls are probably pleading their innocence with people going, you're unclean, you're unpure, second-hand goods and all this lot. You've had sex before, and they can quite rightly say, no, I haven't. And they won't be believed. You know, if you're going to base... I get tradition, but science... You know, a hymen is just, it's a, it's a tiny flap of skin and a lot of things can damage it. A lot of things can tear it, not just the first time you have sex. So that's something to bear in mind. So that's already an obstacle these women have to kind of contend with. The fact that this thing could be broken just day to day if you're quite physical. If you, like, again, if you ride horses, if you ride a bike, there's lots of other ways that a hymen can be broken, not just sex. So if anybody watching this, please bear that in mind. It doesn't necessarily mean that they've been that somebody has had sex before you because there is the hymen isn't in place. First and foremost, okay, are these people cashing in? Potentially, yes, I think it is. If they're marketing in as, you know, when they, when they use marketing terms like restore your innocence, yes, I think at that point they are cashing in. I think they are marketing on fear. However, by offering these operations, are they saving young women from, you know, the potential negative effects of not having it done, rightly or wrongly. Yes, they are. That's a, it's a, it's a horrible state of affairs, but yeah, these girls can have, like I say, they can have severe consequences if on the first day they, you know, on, you know, day one in bed with the new husband, that there's not this and again, I mean, it's they're just expected to, to go through this discomfort and, and bleed during sex and, you know, to prove that they're, they're fresh out of the box, if you will. And it's like, oh, my God, just. So, yeah, if having this operation for them avoids all the unpleasantness of them not having it, you know, and all the kind of horrible stigma that will come down at them wrongly, then maybe it, maybe they are serving a need, a need, but they're going about it the wrong way. You know, you shouldn't be marking it as this, and this more should be done to kind of educate these people who think, oh well, you know, this who think that 
tradition is above everything else and more to be done to them say look hymen is not an indication of virginity that surely that needs to be a more of a discussion as well you know rather than these young women going right well this is this is the um this is what you expect this is what's expected of you wrongly so so let's spend thousands kind of making it to get you to that spot you know, but as things stand, then yeah, maybe, yeah, they're cashing in, but they're cashing in on something that needs to happen for the time being because of the way, you know, this is, because of the expectations on them, wrongly put on them, but until those change, operations like this are available and probably need to be because, again, you know, things like horrible things like honour killings and things have taken place because of stuff like this. People, families think that you know, they have slighted another, you know, or another family has slighted them because their daughter wasn't pure, and it's, oh, God, it's just, isn't it just terrible? So for the time being, until you can get past that, then maybe these operations can avoid all that unpleasantness. And again, like I'm saying, it shouldn't have to be this way, but as long as it is, then it's tricky, isn't it? Anyway, let me know what you think down below, but, you know, let's move on. It's a bit of an icky story. Story number three. This one's a bit lighter. You're a millions winner who won 105 million, still works as a builder two months later. This is in the mirror today. So the reason I put this story is because I've always had a very, a very singular idea about what lottery winners should do, which I'll tell you at the end. So let's give me the story first. So you're a millions jackpot winner who scooped 105 million, is still working hard as a builder two months later. Steve Thompson, 42, installed a new front door and double-glazed windows at a property near his three-bedroom home in Selsey, West Sussex. Picture shows Steve in a black windproof jacket, jeans and a beanie while holding a handsaw cut in white wooden frames. Earlier, Steve promised not to let his customers down before Christmas and said he would be completing all his current building jobs. He told the mirror last December after his win, I'm going back to work, but not until at least next week. Everything is just really overwhelming at the minute. Yeah, too right, mate. He added that a mountain of cash was too much for us, referring to himself and his wife, Lenka. Um... We're going to do a lot of good with this money. It's too much for us. It's so much money. I'm going to be generous, sensibly generous. Good man. Stephen Lenker, 41, were revealed as the lucky winners of the life-changing jackpot in November and said they plan to buy a new home so their three children can have their own bedrooms. Steve's neighbour, Ellie Wood, said Steve and his wife are the salt of the earth. I'm not shocked that Steve is continuing to finish off jobs he had in his books. That's just the type of guy he is. He'd never leave anyone in the lurch. Okay, so... My thought has always been, if you win the lottery, lottery is life-changing money. And it always annoyed me when people were like, oh, you know, they win millions and they're on the news going, ah, it won't change me, I'll be back at work on Monday. I'm like, well, it should change you. If it's not going to change you, why bother? Why bother winning it if your life is going to be exactly the same as it was before? The idea is that now your life can just branch off and you can do insane, crazy things and you can you know, help out your family and friends and do all these amazing things with it. If you're just going to continue life as you did before, then why win the money? That's always been my thought. This is a little bit different because the guy's like, no, these, these things were on my books. And because I've got money now, I'm not going to suddenly go, well, you know, and you know, that extension you need, that roof repair, that whatever you needed doing, nah, I'm not going to bother with that. Find another builder. He's like, no, I committed to this and I'm going to do it. So my attitude would be a little different if he was going to continue going forward completely. But again, if he's doing it for, you know, if he said something like, I'm the only builder in the area and people trust me and, you know, I've got lots of little old ladies who want jobs doing. So I'm going to continue doing that going forward. That I'm okay with. But for people who, who do this and don't change their life, you kind of like, well, what's the point? So he's not said that. He said, look, I'm going to finish off what I had booked because I had things booked months in advance. And then it sounds like he's going to step back. He said he's going to, you know, it's too much money for him. As 105 million is probably too much money for anyone realistically. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to be sensibly generous. with That's a brilliant term. Sensibly generous. I'm going to give plenty away, but to worthy things. So fair play to this guy. He's going to, he's going to you know, honour his commitments. And then he's hopefully going to step back with his wife and have... You know, him and his family are going to have an amazing life um, with this, you know, this this lottery win. So, good man. Anyway, let's move on. Happy story. Now, let's, get, let's see what happens when money doesn't go your way. Story number four. So, this is in AFP by MSN News. The French court orders a 52 billion euro payout in the Mona Lisa Ferrari battle. Yes. So, 
can we all just agree that the Ferrari, the 250 GT, is a gorgeous machine? It's absolutely beautiful, and this is a particular example you will see here. French Peel's Court has ordered the son of renowned Ferrari collector to pay his siblings millions of euros over a disputed sale of a coveted racer considered the storied Italian automaker's Mona Lisa. So, Patrick Bardenon was sued for breach of trust after auction off a race, a rare 1964 Ferrari 250 GTO to a Taiwanese buyer in 2014 for 38 million euros. 42 million dollars at the current rates, a record at the time. He says it was a gift from his father, Pierre Bardino, a descendant of the family behind luxury fur and leather house Chapal, after Patrick was in a horrendous racing accident. Uh, my father thought I had died that day, he said last March when the lawsuit first came to court. But Anne and Jean-Francois Bardino claimed their brother secretly removed the car from their father's collection and unlawfully sold the crown jewel of their shared inheritance. The pair lost their initial challenge, but the appeals court in Limoges ruled Wednesday in the siblings' favour, and Bardino's lawyer said on Friday. It ordered Patrick to return the sale proceeds plus interest as well as the auction commission a total of 52.3 million euros uh, to the Common Inheritance Fund. And Bardino welcomes the decision that conforms with the truth, the law and fairness that her father always sought to maintain with regard to his three children, her lawyer Julien Damilacour says. Uh, Pierre Bardner, who died in 2012, had amassed an unrivaled collection of more than 60 Ferraris at his Mar du Clos estate, which had its own racetrack in central France. That's a good life, is that it? If you've, got, if you've got 60 Ferraris on your own racetrack at your estate. Most of the cars were bought in rough shape, cheaply, and were painstakingly restored. The 1964 GTO was purchased in 1978 for just $700, or about 2800 in today's money. Pierre spent another $1,500 fixing it up. Only 39 GTOs were built from 1962 to 1964, and they have since become some of the most fabled Ferraris in the world, deemed the hottest car of all time by the magazine Popular Mechanics in 2017. A stunning shape and incredible 3 litre V12 mixes the definitive exotic. It couldn't be more gorgeous than the magazine gushed. Yeah, so sibling rivalry. So basically, he's like, you know, I was an accident. Basically, it sounds like he's saying, I was daddy's favourite. So he took the car, which was going to be. That's the crown jewel in any collection, and again, it's it's Ferrari's Mona Lisa. It's his unicorn. It's his, you know, the the perfect expression of what Ferrari was, and he sold it without letting his siblings know. And it sounds like the court said, "Nope, that was those cars are after your father died. That were part of the inheritance fund, and they had to be whatever happens to them all. Proceeds were split between all three of you. So now he's been ordered to." pay back the money and the interest and auction fees all back into the inheritance fund for the three of them. So I completely agree with the two siblings here. It was right to take off court action against him because he did it without telling them. The fact he did it without telling them tells me he knew it was wrong. Otherwise he'd have said, you know, you know, dad want me to have the Ferrari, the 250. I'm going to auction it off because I need the money. So the fact that he didn't tell them tells me he knew they'd react badly or that it was unlawful and the court has now agreed. So he's had to give it back. So... Let's hope he didn't spend it, but yeah, where do you come up with 52 million euros? That's the, that's a big amount, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I literally want to do the story because I just love that car. It's beautiful, absolute artwork as far as cars go. Anyway, story number five, let's finish strong with a nice happy story. Game is having a seizure saved by online friend 5,000 miles away. This is on Sky News today. Yes. Teenage gamer in Cheshire who had a seizure in his room, unbeknownst to his parents, was saved when his friend called the police from 5,000 miles away in Texas. So Aiden Jackson, 17, told Sky News he felt a little funny and so turned his microphone to his bed where he planned to lie down, but he had a seizure. Uh, Dale Athora, 20, an online gamer, friend of Aiden's from Texas, realised what was happening and he got in contact with the emergency services. The call went, hi, I'm calling from the US, I'm currently in a call with my friend, he's had a seizure, he's not responding anymore. I do have his address where he lives in Widnes, Cheshire. Uh, Ms. Lathora said, before apologising, I'm sorry, I'm shaking. While police and ambulance were dispatched, Aiden's parents were downstairs, unaware of what was happening. Uh, the first we knew of it, two police cars arrived out front, said Aiden's mother, Caroline Jackson. That must have been terrifying. We had a, a, a look thinking they were going elsewhere, and then they started to run up our path. The officers told Ms. Jackson they had received reports of an unresponsive male at the residence. She responded that nobody at the address had made any calls, but the officers assured her the call about a possible seizure came from America. They rushed upstairs to find Aiden, who had only recalled going to lie down on his bed. The next thing I knew, I was waking up with the police and parents in my room, saying I had a seizure. He added that um, 
when he was in hospital, he used his mother's tablet to thank Miss Lathora at least maybe five, ten times for it. I thank her every time I see her. Aidan had previously experienced a seizure in May 2019, and the 70-year-old is awaiting a new appointment after the most recent incident. So yeah, uh, you know, fantastic. It's kind of like gaming community at its best. This is when it works, you know. So he's chatting away, and you know what kids are like. They sometimes they'll disappear into the bedroom for hours, and you know, as parents, we don't always check because you know we're up there and they don't want to be disturbed, especially at a young age. And they're kind of like, you know, Dad, leave me alone. So I'm okay, fine. So he's on a call to his friend. He has a seizure. He lays down. He feels funny unresponsive and the friend has a foresight to ring the police and say look you know I'm on an online call with somebody 5,000 miles and again fair play to the emergency services that somebody can record, report somebody having it doesn't tell you the time frame but somebody can report having a, a seizure to police in Texas and the police cars arrive at witness in Cheshire you know and that system fantastic because you wouldn't have thought of it. You'd have thought, for me, I'd have thought, well, what can I do? I'm all these miles away. But there is stories like this. Is like when people get into trouble and they throw something up on Facebook. It's like, you know, I've just seen this. And then within minutes, this community, when it works well, it works so well. So, yeah. So, Aiden, you know, he's previously had a seizure in May. And now he's had another one. So I'm guessing there's, they're going to, you know, he's got a new appointment. They're going to get into it and kind of see what's causing it and if it can be managed or, you know, prevented. But yeah, absolutely brilliant that, um, what was that young lady's name? Dear. Well done to Dear for this. Um, again, it must have been terrifying for the parents because you're completely unaware and then police cars outside and you know what it's like, you know, you hear excuse me, you look out the window and you know what's going on and they run up your path and say we've got an unresponsive male and at first you're like, no, we haven't. And they're like, it's upstairs, you know, how horrible must it be for them? But, you know, everybody's fine. It's a really good positive story of community being used the right way. You know, and the fact that just as human beings, we should all be looking out for each other, no matter what distance is between us. And I just think that's a nice thing to end on. So that's it, guys. Let's leave it at that. Links to all the stories I've discussed today can be found in the description below. Feel free to go and check them out. Let me know what you think about this video and tell me if you won the lottery, would you go back to work? If you had appointments, would you would you fulfil them? Or would you pay somebody else to fulfil them for you so you not let people down? Or would you just go, nah, I'm out, I've got my money and that's it. So, answers in the comments please, along with any thoughts you'd like to share. These are mine, they're not necessarily important, they're not necessarily right or wrong, they're just what was on my mind. So until next time, bye for now.